just a little uh, explanation to start with. Um, the last time I was up here, I was saying that would be probably the last time we'd have a go, but uh, since I made that announcement, I've had quite a few, including your pastor, encourage me to have another go to, to see what, what we can provide. So that's the reason. But dads, it's your day. And it's a wonderful day for dads. And it's lovely to know that dads get recognised, isn't it? Because sometimes dads get pushed aside and Mother's Day seems to be the one day of the year that's important. But uh, they're both important and it's wonderful to be able to be a dad. Have we got dads here? We got, yeah. yeah. Got a hands up for dad? And what about if you're a grandfather? You got a hands up too? Oh, good. That's lovely. <laughs> okay, thank you. We wouldn't put our hands down because I'll get accused of having a charismatic service. So. <laughs> but you know what I, I, I like about dads? There's not too much I don't know because I've been one for a while. But I do know this. Modern phones are deadly. Particularly in the wrong hands. <laughs> but at least I know it was lovely to have my daughter take me and to stay with me during that time on Tuesday and she had something to occupy herself with. This is my squaring off with all the things like my brothers said to me, are you drunk? <laughs> anyway. But what I do know is that dads like to eat. And dads are pretty good on food. I've seen some fellowship Tea's put away here very smartly. And so, yes, we, we do like to eat. And that's a, that's, a, that's a common thing. And of course, today, there's such an emphasis on food. You've got two free-to-air channels just devoted to food, how to cook it, how to prepare it, and sort of different cuisines that you can get. And then you've got so many um, people with extra knowledge that are going to help you do that. People like Jamie Oliver who's helping the children in public schools and in schools in England to get away from that cloggy, terrible food that they get in England and to eat something decent like vegetables. Oh. <laughs> I knew I'd get a response from Jamie. <laughs> but that's what he attempted to do. And of course in Australia we've got people like Maddie, Maggie Beer and Luke Niren and you've got Nigel Lawson just take a breath. And, but that's, that's what it is. And you know, food's important because we need it. Some enjoy it more than others, and, but others are called foodies and others aren't. And so but that's, that's our life today. Now, you know, it involves the three senses, doesn't it? The sight, the smell, and taste. Because we're in this age and today, does it mean that it was any different in the time of Jesus? So I've done some research, and what I found is this. I'm only just going to give you some of the stuff that I have briefly looked through, but there's heaps more. I can tell you there's heaps more. It's Jesus' association with food. And the first one, thanks Kim, the first one where Jesus is confronted by the devil. Right? You can read it. I don't need to read it. And the devil saying that is tempting him. Because what's he tempting him with? Stones. <laughs> Bread. Bread. And you know what? After my research, I found that the food that is the most favoured and most wanted by the Jew... 2,000 years ago, in the time of Jesus, was bread. Now, when I read that, then that explains what you read in scriptures and how bread comes through so often. So this was the first one. And then, of course, we read of Jesus' first ministry where he goes to the town of Cana and then he goes to a wedding. And there's going to be no food at the wedding, is there? Because there's only wine. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> People look forward to that, that time for, for months. 
And then we find Jesus calling people. And, and Michael touched on it last week when he spoke about Matthew. And Matthew was a mocky. A mocky, he was, he was the chief of the tax collectors. He was the one who controlled them all. And if you've ever watched Humphrey Bogart movies, The Maltese Falcon, Sydney Green Street was a mocky, the guy, the big fat guy in the white suit. Well, that was, that was Matthew. And he had money, he had position, he had influence. But what did he do? He invited Jesus down and he provided a banquet for him, my NLT says. He gives him a banquet. And then we find Jesus at the home of the Pharisee. Well, the Pharisee was rich and he had money. But he wanted to know a little bit more about Jesus and he wanted to test him and he invites him for lunch. Well, Jesus was a little bit upset about this because when he got there, he said to the guy, look, I've been here now for this time. You haven't even provided me with the essentials. The essentials being that when you go to a person's place like this, and particularly a person who has wealth, uh, they have servants, and their servant's job is to wash your feet. They didn't have macadamised roads in those days, and so um, their feet were dusty, and when you're sitting all together lying on couches to eat, uh, it's pleasanter if you have your feet washed. And Jesus says, well, you didn't even do that at the meal for me. And then the next one we see is Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, of course, again, invites Jesus to his place and he gives him a feed too. So Jesus goes to another feast and, of course, once Jesus has been to one of these places for a meal, their places and those homes are never the same again. They're never the same again. And you read, and the people have followed him and accepted him because he's been there. And of course, then we read of Jesus's, of Peter's mother in law. Now, we don't know much about the disciples and uh, their background, their lives, their private lives. We don't know if they had kids. But we know that Peter was married because he had a mother-in-law. His mother-in-law had a fever. So Peter says to his good friend Jesus, can you come and help me? And she's got this fever. I don't know what to do. So Jesus came. He healed her. Well, the part that I liked... The last line it says, and she got up and served them. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> she knew her place. Wait, I thought I'd get a response. <laughs> then we read about he fed not one, not two, but 4,000. He fed them. And then there was another occasion where he fed 5,000. And what did he feed? What did he give them? Fish and bread. Fish and bread. Fish and bread. What's their favourite food? Bread. Bread. Then we find one more. The disciples have been out fishing after the resurrection of Jesus and they come back and there's Jesus on the shore. There's a fire going. And he's cooking. And he says, hey, give me a couple of those decent sort of fish that you've caught. So he puts them on and Jesus becomes the chef. Jesus becomes the cook. Now, what meal would God prepare for me? He would prepare for me my favourite meal. And everybody knows if I go out and buy a takeaway, what will I buy? Caroline, you know? Fish and chips. Oh, fish and chips? Yeah. That's my favourite meal. And what does Jesus do for his disciples? Fish and chips. Well, I mean, 
a little bit of license, you know, you don't want to get the facts in the way of a good story. <laughs> but he gives them bread and fish. So that's why I like fish and chips, because it's spiritual. Amen. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> but Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Got that one, Kim? I am the bread of life. No one who comes after me will hunger again. Let's have a look now at this last section which I just want to touch on because it's the time when Jesus went to his friend's place and no doubt he had many meals there and he had friends called Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And the story there was uh, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha would uh, welcome him to her home. Okay, that's the story in brief. It wasn't only Martha, but her sister Mary too. And I think I might have touched on this story a couple of years ago, so I'm sure you all have remembered every bit and so uh, you'll say, oh, this is all I'll have. It's time for me to drop off. <laughs> That's okay. But I might have something new to, to share with you. Now, as Jesus was approaching the village of Bethany, he was already invited to come and spend a luncheon. Invited by Mary and Martha to come and share a meal together. But before we do that, have we got the Philippians one, Kim? Have we got the Philippians ready? That's the one. Yeah, just before we go into the story, just this, you know, just read that. Do everything without complaining so that no one can accuse you of whatever it is. Okay? Just remember that, because that's what we're going to look at. We're just going to look at that right now. We're going to just have a look into the kitchen of Martha and Mary. And as we do, we see only one person in the kitchen. It's a big hot place. And... Uh, there's steam everywhere and there's food prepared and some not prepared and there's bread being prepared and rolled and so there's just one person there and one person on her own like doing all this all this work and so let's perhaps have a listen and see what's going on and so we could see this person was very red of face and had flowers streaked across her cheeks and her aprons. And she was really working hard because it was very hot, the fires were going, and she's muttering away to herself, Oh yes, Jesus, please come and share a meal with us. We would love to have you, says my sister Mary. And then what does she do? No sooner than he's here, she hairs off straight away and races in there to be with him. And what's the result? I'm left here to do it all on my own. Look at all this I've still got to do. Sure, she gave me a hand to start with, but now I've got to finish it all off. It's not going to happen unless I do it. You know, there's no supermarket or Woolies or Coles that's down the road. What we have is the village market or the souk that we could go to. It's not fair. Okay feel that this is not right. So she stews on this for a little bit longer and then she decides action is needed. I, I can see this, the scene. Inside is the other room and we don't know how many disciples came to this meal. They were invited too, but we don't know how many. 
But I could assume that there would have been half a dozen. And Mary's and in already in there, of course. Martha's out in the kitchen doing the doing the stuff that she's doing. And so she decides to march in and I need to have a little bit of a say. So she moves into this room, and that's the room is going on, this is quiet conversation and the hum and the the atmosphere is so warm and friendly. And as Martha comes into this room, this large sweat laden, flower encrusted, bread faced lady stands there and says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me all alone to do all the work? Well, is that a conversation killer? I'm pretty sure it would have been. All of a sudden, Mary now finds a great interest in her feet as she looks at them. The disciples are gobsmacked. They, they don't know what to say or do. And so there's this silence, but only Jesus speaks. Because only Jesus knows the problem. Because the problem is not the large crowd. The problem is not Mary's choice. Because hers was the correct one. Can you place yourself in that situation? of Mary here's Jesus coming to your place to stay what do you want to do? stand in the kitchen and cook or run upstairs and dust all the furniture or water the garden? of course you don't you'll want to be listening to what he has to say it's God here amongst us I want to, I want to be there even though it was unusual at the time for a, an unattached young woman to be following uh, the disciples around at that time but the problem was also not Martha's choice to set them a meal or to give them a meal the problem was Martha's heart the problem was Martha's heart she knew it was involved when she invited them to come and Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worrying about many things. Now Max Ricardo wrote a book called He Still Moves Stones. And in that book, uh, he mentions this situation, this story. And he says, Martha, Martha, bless her little heart. Martha wanted to do right, but her heart was wrong. Her heart said, I have to worry about getting everything done. I have to please. And I worry about each of those. And so she turned from a happy servant into a beast uh, of burden. No what the problem is worry makes you forget who's in charge worry makes you forget who's in charge Martha was so worried that she started ordering God around tell my sister to help me Lord and you know that's what happens to any of us when we forget who's in charge. Warren Wearsby also said on this same subject that Martha's problem was not that she had so much to do, but that she was trying to serve two masters and that pulled her apart. She was trying to serve these two masters as if it was so, and if it is so difficult to do that, that it makes you difficult and unpleasant to work with, then you have a problem. Then you have a problem. 
the right uh, the right time for us to consider our service is when we find that we're becoming difficult to work with. Esau and Jacob had a similar problem because you remember the story of Jacob and he was taken the right of his brother Esau by deceit and of course he worried about that all of, his, all of his life, he felt guilty and then he hadn't met up with Esau but after about 40, 50 years Esau was coming to meet him and Jacob was a little bit concerned you might say because Esau was coming with 400 men and Jacob did everything that he could he divided his whole livestock, his whole um, family he sent half of them up ahead to meet with Esau as the sort of a salve to, to let Esau know I'm only doing this because um, I, I want you to know that I'm, I'm happy that you're still coming no, he's, he's trying to save himself and so that night he goes to sleep and he wrestles with God. And then the next morning Esau arrives. And Esau runs up and they both embrace as if there was nothing wrong. You see, Jacob forgot who was in charge. Jacob had forgotten who was in charge. And you know, one of the blessings that we've had here in the last... Uh, six months or so that Michael's been here with us is that we've been able to touch base with people in our community and this was the thing that worried us and I know I used to harp on about this but uh, I was so concerned the fact that here we are as a small church and yet how can we reach these people, how can how can they know that we're here? How can we help? What can we do? And we try in varying ways and that, but since we've had our hampers going, it's been wonderful. It's been a wonderful response. Michael has been able to help so many people, even getting shoes for a lady who wanted to start a business. And yeah, all this sort of stuff and being able to have an impact with Terry Young and others in the area. And it's just been wonderful. And I worried and I worried about that all the time. But you see, I forgot. I forgot who was in charge. God's in charge. He's in charge of this place. And I think that perhaps the lesson that I've learnt from this exercise this morning, I need to be like Mary. I need to spend more time at Jesus' feet. Thanks, Carol.